Hey fellow a &P nerds, and as always, I say that as a compliment, whose disembodied voice is this? Well, it's me, your favorite, or as I always say, at least give me top five online a &P professors, presenting you with this little lecture, this little video nugget I call, hey, let's draw a neuron. What you can see here, I hope, is a drawn out neuron. One of the cells of your nervous system. Not the only cell, remember you have all those glial cells too. Hopefully you've learned about some of these in your lecture. But I would suggest that right now, before we get into this exercise, you get yourself a piece of paper oriented landscape sideways, maybe a bunch of colored pencils, maybe the kids crayons, maybe some highlighters, something like that, because we're going to get to drawing this thing in just a few minutes. I would also have at the ready, perhaps, my textbook showing me a picture of a neuron that looks something like this one this being what we call a multipolar neuron because it has more than two projections coming off of the cell body of the neuron. I would also have somewhere handy, perhaps for review, a list of the steps in the firing of a neuron if you have such a list, if there's a list itemized out in your textbook, if you have a piece of paper with a list of the steps on it as provided by your lecture professor. And if you don't see the benefit in drawing this neuron, well, you can, of course, just look at this one. And there's nothing wrong with this one, but the great benefit that you'll get is through drawing one of your own. If we look at this neuron that I have drawn, I want you to understand that the whole job of a neuron is to spit a neurotransmitter at some sort of target cell that you can just see. Let's not make that plural that I've drawn one in here on the far left. So the job of this neuron is simply put the following. Listen close. Here's what neurons do. They spit. They spit out a neurotransmitter. They spit a ligand from right here across this gap we call a synapse to right there. This is what neurons do. This is really all they do. They don't get shorter. They don't get longer. In fact, were they to get shorter or longer, in most instances, you would kill the cell. So, they don't have all the moving parts that a skeletal muscle cell does that if you look above, you might see, you know, in your list of videos, hey, let's draw a muscle cell. We have one of those too. So what we will do is draw one of these things, and I'll describe the parts for you as I draw it. So the actual drawing of your own, hopefully, is what will help you. So I've left this image up long enough for us to look at it, and you can see that I have also provided a key that goes with this diagram. So we will make ourselves one of these. I'll take you through the steps in drawing a neuron. So let's move to a blank slate and draw ourselves a neuron. Great big thing. And it's the act of drawing the neuron that hopefully helps us learn the parts, learn some of the functions of these parts a little bit. I'll try to not get too in-depth into all the various steps in the creation and action potential these cells have. Right here, we're focusing mainly on drawing the cell and learning some of the parts. So what I would do first on the far left is start making myself sort of an incomplete, I'll build in a few gaps here, see I'll leave a gap, 
sort of a quasi circle like this and then it sort of tapers down like so like that right there beautiful and in the middle of this thing I'm gonna put a nucleus This region or area of the cell is what we call the cell body. Sometimes you hear it referred to as the soma. This is where the nucleus of the cell is. This is the area of the cell that is most, how would I say it, cell-like, does most of the cell things. This is where I would have some endoplasmic reticulum. You remember that from cells with a whole bunch of ribosomes on it. Here's some ribosomes. Go back to your prerequisite course if you had one, you know, protein synthesis, all that business happening right here. And in a neuron, these endoplasmic reticulum pieces and ribosomes get so thick looking that under a light microscope, they're easy to see. These are what are called the Nissel bodies. You'll probably see that in your lab course. The only other specific part of the cell body you might be required to know in a lot of courses would be components of the cytoskeleton you see sort of tapering down here along with the cell. These are called neurofibrils providing shape to the cell and allowing it to narrow down like that. Projections coming off the cell body in our picture are going to be kind of numerous. So draw these projections and of course feel free to pause me, fast forward me, rewind me all that's needed for you to make this picture. But I'm going to start making projections. Now remember I mentioned more than two projections coming off the cell body is what makes this thing a multipolar neuron. And the one I'm drawing for us is definitely multipolar. And I want you to draw these structures sort of tree-like with lots of branches coming off of them, sort of like so. And of course, this is your neuron, people, so you draw it however you want to. I'm drawing these branchy structures right here. They live here. Happy neurons, right? Like the joy of biological drawing. So highly branching projections coming off my neuron like so. And they could be quite extensive. Look at the pictures that you might have in your textbook, I'm really not doing all the branching justice here, but I want you to have some idea of a lot of branching that we see. Like that. I'm using a dark background and light colors, so hopefully everything stands out well for you so you can see it in a video format here. So you'll notice on the left, all of these highly branching structures, and they would go extend well off the screen, typically is what we would have. And these things are called dendrites of my cell. These are the dendrites. Dender referring to branching like a tree. These are the dendrites, all these branching structures. So these are all dendrites. And over here to the right where my cell begins to narrow down, I want you to draw a great big long and fairly skinny projection that ends and sorry for my lack of artistic talent, but sort of ends 
in some knobs like that. This part of the cell is called the axon. This long wire-like projection coming off of the cell. This axon is what allows these cells to be some of the longest in the human body, up to a meter in length in some of us, a little more in people who are taller. So it's a pretty long cell. These would definitely be the longest cells in the body, winning that title over the skeletal muscle fibers. The structures at the end that we see right here are called the synaptic terminals. or sometimes referred to as the presynaptic terminals, and sometimes by their French name, the boutons, meaning the buttons. And it's from these points where the neurotransmitter gets spit out onto some target cell or other. I'm going to draw in a target cell right here target cell, just like I did above. Now this target cell could be a skeletal muscle fiber like you probably already know about. This target cell could be another neuron. It could be a smooth muscle fiber. It could be a cardiac muscle fiber. It could be any number of things. This is just a general, generic old target cell for us. And it's across this small gap that we call the synapse right here, the synapse or the synaptic cleft synaptic cleft where the neurotransmitters will be spit across. So in these synaptic terminals I'm going to draw a bunch of vesicles, little membrane-bound cell organelles, you know how it goes, containing NT neurotransmitters, NT, just my way of abbreviating neurotransmitters, NT, NT. So here I have vesicles, sometimes they're called synaptic vesicles, containing neurotransmitters, T-T-E-R-S, neurotransmitters. These are the ligands, the chemicals, spit out by neurons. Acetylcholine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, glutamate. We could go on and on. You'll probably have a list in your lecture that you'll be asked to memorize. So the neurotransmitters are going to be spit across this synaptic cleft landing on the target cell. In fact, the whole basis of this operation is to get those neurotransmitters spit across this synaptic cleft. Now follow my cursor if you can see it back here to the area where the cell narrows down, right here. This sort of uh, triangular shaped area that I'm highlighting in black here with dashed lines, sort of makes a delta shape. This is referred to as the axon hillock. This is where the cell narrows down into this biological wire that we call an axon. When I look at this cell, I have to keep in mind that it is an actual living cell. It has cell membrane made of a double layer of phospholipids, etc., etc., all that stuff. It has cytoplasm, a nucleus, ribosomes. It does cell stuff needs oxygen. Boy, do these cells need oxygen. They're so bad at anaerobic metabolism. But it's a cell. It's just a weird looking cell, isn't it? It's a cell all built around being able to 
produce this electrochemical signal that allows it on the far right end to spit out a neurotransmitter. It creates, it generates an action potential starting right around here where the axon hillock is. Now, being the, the subtle guy that I am, I think it might help us if I just draw you in an arrow, and I'm just trying to pick a color here that'll stand out. I guess I'll use the red. I'll be very subtle here and try to just give you a hint so you know what direction the action potential goes in. AP. It only travels from left to right on this picture, from the dendrite end to the terminal end, or from the axon hillock, more specifically, to the axon or synaptic terminals. So that's the direction that an action potential is able to run. But it can only run that way because of all these ion channels that we have to travel down the length of this axon. And something we have that can make the action potential travel faster is, of course, the myelin sheath on a neuron made up of glial cells which in this neuron that I'm drawing will say it's a somatic motor neuron which makes these things Schwann cells. If we were in the central nervous system, these would be oligodendrocytes. So I'll label this a Schwann cell. So here's one Schwann cell, here's another Schwann cell, here's another Schwann cell. And the Schwann cells, because of the way they myelinate the axon, wrap around it even, you know, up to a hundred times with the lipid membrane of this cell, do not draw this part, everyone. If I looked at this axon on end cut like this, you'll have a diagram like this in your textbook. The Schwann cell wraps around it and around it and around it and around it and around like so, creating what we call a myelin sheath when it's all wrapped up like that, which insulates the wire and allows for what? Saltatory conduction, we call it. Notice between the Schwann cells, we have little gaps. These are called nodes. Right here is one. Here's another. These are called nodes. On your picture, let's label them a node of, if we want to be very formal, a person's name, a la Francais, everyone. This is a node of Ranvier. Many times in American English, we sort of bastardize the word into something that rhymes with reindeer, so you'll hear people say note of reindeer, and then some people in American English just cop out altogether and they just call them notes, dropping the name off, but formally note of Ranvier. It's important to note the node because the action potential is able to travel much quicker down an axon that has a myelin sheath, as you'll learn about in your lectures, with the signal zipping very quickly under the Schwann cell because it's insulated from node to node to node. So pay attention to that in your lecture when all the steps are explained to you. The last thing I'm going to say before I start filling out some ion channels for you, because look at this picture, the one you're seeing in front of you right here, and the one I'd already created, this one looks a little messier, doesn't it? because it includes a whole bunch of ion channels, sodium potassium pumps, and so on, which we just haven't stuck into this picture that we're creating yet. Oh, but we will, everyone. But one last thing I want to highlight before I move on is about these Schwann cells, or 
remember in the brain or spinal cord they would be oligodendrocytes performing this job. This thing that you see right here, this is one Schwann cell. This is not the myelin sheath, it's just a Schwann cell. To see the entire myelin sheath, I have to use or incorporate all the Schwann cells. So here to here, that's the myelin sheath. I know it's getting messy, but a messy picture, that's a good picture. That's what I said. That's the myelin sheath is all the Schwann cells together, not just one. And a little naming thing, you'll see if you watch my lab video where I go through the parts of a neuron that can be rather irritating. I can show you here with a little bit of a close-up. Don't let yourself get confused by this terminology, everybody. So watch my black dots. This, the cell membrane of the Schwann cell, is the neurolemma. That's what it's called. It's not technically the cell membrane of the neuron, but that's the reference. So the cell membrane of the Schwann cell is the neurolemma. The cell membrane of the axon is called the axonolemma. And I can see it, I could see it here at the node, right? Axonolemma. So don't let yourself get confused by those two terms when you see them in a lab setting, you know, looking at a model of one of these things. Neurolemma and axonolemma, two different structures. Watch that lab video, uh, lab number seven, or the brain and neuron lab that I have. Make sure that you watch that one and you can see it on a model. So let's get started drawing in some ion channels because this cell's ability to do which is the spitting noise, is all based on its ability to respond to electrochemical signals. So I'm going to start with a red color, make a little key color code. There we go. Red color. Just like we did with the skeletal muscle fiber, if you are chromatically challenged, you don't have a bunch of colors, make X's and O's and diamonds and triangles or something like that. So here we have what's called a stimulus gated sodium channel. Now, remember, feel free to fast forward me. This is an exercise to help you learn the parts of this cell and a little bit about its function. But if you know all this, you can draw it much faster. The drawing of it, I think, is what really helps you out in your lecture and on your lecture test. So stimulus-gated sodium ion channels. Emphasize the word stimulus. Don't we have some neurons that are sensory? And they can respond to what? Touch. That's me slapping the back of my hand. Touch. Others can respond to temperature. Still others can respond to light. Some sensory neurons, think of your nose and your tongue, they respond to chemicals. Some respond to pain stimuli. So we have all sorts of different stimuli that a neuron could respond to. It could be a chemical, could be physical pressure, could be any number of things, so we have to use a general term here. So we say stimulus-gated sodium ion channels. And where do they live? All over the dendrites and on the cell body. So draw in your stimulus-gated sodium ion channels on the cell body of your neuron and all over the dendrites. Take your time, make it look nice. You got to be able to draw at least as well as I can.
There we go. Stimulus gated sodium ion channels. Now you'll notice there are quite a few of them that I've drawn in here. A whole bunch of stimulus gated sodium ion channels. And they're all over these dendrites, which could extend way farther left than we see in this picture. I wouldn't expect that they would all be activated at once. They're all spread out over a wide area so they can respond to a stimulus wherever it occurs. So branching out the dendrites covered with stimulus-gated sodium ion channels as is the cell body of my neuron. What would make this stimulus-gated sodium ion channel open up? The correct stimulus. Now understand this neuron that we have right here, this one that I've drawn, it will only respond to one stimulus. Maybe it responds to heat. That's it. Maybe it responds to cold. That's it. We have each of those. Maybe it responds to acetylcholine. Then that's all it knows how to speak. That's all that would open up any of these stimulus-gated sodium ion channels. So the neuron has a specific stimulus that it can respond to, and that's it. But we use a general term for all neurons, and that term is stimulus-gated. Next up, I'll choose a color here. Sky blue, I think, will stand out. We have, just like in skeletal muscle, our voltage-gated sodium ion channels. Voltage gate. And again, remember, you can fast forward through me if I'm talking more than you want to hear. So in blue, we have a voltage gated sodium ion channel. What makes it open? A voltage change. A change of the resting membrane potential sufficient to make it open it would be this one that starts an action potential, wouldn't it? And where do these live? I'm going to draw a great big one right here, another one right here, maybe at the nodes, and down here on the synaptic terminal, the end of the thing. Voltage-gated sodium ion channels. These are the ones that open during the action potential. The action potential will start about right here. Now, there's a little naming thing that goes along with this location on the axon hillock of the first voltage-gated sodium ion channel. This is usually called the initial segment of my neuron. Sometimes this particular spot is called the trigger point. The initial segment, watch this everybody, I'm going to highlight again just a smaller part of the axon hillock. This is where the voltage gated ion channels begin. Where I have that first Number one, voltage-gated sodium ion channel is often referred to specifically as the trigger point. So you'll hear those two terms maybe thrown around in your lecture or your textbook, initial segment and trigger point. That's where we have that first voltage-gated sodium ion channel, the first one. Because remember, the action potential goes from left to right, starting right here where I have the initial segment slash trigger point changing colors in my drawing. Let's go with, I think, purple. This would be my voltage-gated potassium ion channel. We have those two. Voltage-gated potassium channels. And where do they live? Well, pretty much everywhere voltage-gated sodiums live. 
We don't talk about them so much, but they're important. They're just a little slower than everybody else. Remember that. You've probably heard that before. Voltage-gated potassium ion channels. We also have, I'll choose the color bronze here, just because it sort of stands out against the blue background. Our third voltage-gated ion channel in this story, which is the voltage-gated calcium ion channel. Voltage-gated calcium ion channels. And where do they live? Down here, everybody, on the presynaptic or synaptic terminals. Voltage-gated calcium ion channels. Now, I want to pause here for just a moment to make sure you notice a difference between this cell and the skeletal muscle cell that we drew in the earlier video that you watched, hopefully. In a skeletal muscle fiber, the calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm of the cell, binds to troponin, causing it to pivot, roll over, fall down, pulling the tropomyosin off the active sites, allowing the myosin heads to grab and pull, grab and pull. You remember all that business? Yeah, hopefully you remember that. Maybe some of you, I just gave you a nightmare flashback. Sorry about that. But here it's much easier because we don't have neuroplasmic reticulum. The calcium does not move from one point to another point in the cell. The calcium here enters from outside the cell in the extracellular fluid. This is where we have all this calcium that's going to come in when you memorize the steps in the firing of a neuron, the calcium will enter the cell, bind to these vesicles, and cause them to go spit out their neurotransmitter. Because remember, the job of the cell is to do what? Spit the neurotransmitter across this gap onto the target cell. What makes it move over here and be spit out? We would call that exocytosis, cell spitting. The calcium moving in. And how does the calcium move in? Through voltage-gated calcium channels. What makes them open? A voltage change, the action potential. The opening of the voltage-gated sodium ion channels creating an unstoppable self-propagating wave that runs down the entire length of the axon. Then I open up a voltage-gated calcium ion channel. Calcium moves in, binds to the vesicle. The vessel does exocytosis, and we get spitting out of that neurotransmitter. So all the activities that we see to the left end of this cell are, in an effort, driving toward creating an action potential, which will allow at the right end of the cell. But since we're going to be talking about the moving of ions, and I know you people, you insist I stay honest with you, as you should, that's your job as an A&P student, you need me to put in some good old sodium potassium pumps. Sodium potassium pump because doesn't that establish my resting membrane potential? So I'll use a great big green glob because this is a globular active transport protein using ATP to pump sodiums out three at a time, potassiums in two at a time. So I'll put some sodium potassium pumps here and there on my cell. They'd be all over the place, of course, but I'll just put a few in so you know that they're here. Right? They actually are there, and they work, and they do their job. Sodium potassium pumps. Pumping sodiums where? Out of the cell. Potassiums where? Into the cell in that unequal ratio of 3 to 2. To make a little mess out of my picture, so here's the picture, all done, labeled, everything like that. Now I'm going to make a mess out of the thing 
giving you a little bit of explanation about the functioning here. So using the same sky blue color that I used for the voltage gated sodium ion channels, I'm going to draw some sodiums here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. And now just to double check my count, I'll draw a little circle around each one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So I've got fifteen sodiums drawn outside my cell, and two-thirds of that would be the number of potassiums that would be inside my cell. What's two-thirds of 15? 10. So let's do this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And just to double check my count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now, of course, in a real cell, the numbers would be far greater than 15 and 10. But here, I think you see that I've established that resting membrane potential, we like to call it, for most neurons, somewhere around negative 70 millivolts, with a greater positive charge outside the cell, a smaller positive charge inside the cell, the difference being about 70 millivolts across the cell membrane. Negative sign because we're talking about the inside of the cell here. Now, the question I always ask in my lectures, you should ask yourself, why did we pump all those sodiums out? Well, just so we could let them back in. That's why we did. That's literally the answer. We pumped all those sodiums out so that we could turn around and let them come back in when we choose to, when we would like to. So stick with me, pause me, come back to this video, watch it as many times as you want because it's right here, watch it. But what happens when the proper stimulus, whatever it is for this neuron, what happens when the proper stimulus, say, hits right here and maybe right here. Then those stimulus-gated sodium ion channels will open and what would sodium do? Sodium would come rushing into the cell through those open doorways, wouldn't it? Because I've set up this First, electrical gradient across the membrane, where it's more positive outside than inside, that would make the sodiums want to move in. And two, a concentration gradient, where I've got a lot of sodium outside, no sodium inside, the sodium definitely wants to move in. This influx of sodium that we're seeing right here, everyone, this is what we call the local or the graded potential of my cell. This is the local or graded potential. So if my cell was hovering around, everyone, at about negative 70 millivolts, the resting membrane potential, like this, so here's where the cell's membrane polarity is, about negative 70, just hanging out right there. As sodium comes rushing in, the inside of the cell gets more positive, doesn't it? And if enough sodium comes in, 
how much? Enough to get me from negative 70 up to about negative 60, negative 55, depends on what book you use. Once I get to right here, my local potential, which is what this is, will become an action potential. We continue, you've seen, I bet you saw a graph look something like this in your textbook. If you haven't, I bet you will. What's happening right here at this spot where the local potential becomes an action potential, that's where we have the opening of the first voltage-gated sodium ion channel, this one right here at the initial segment or the trigger point. So if the local potential is strong enough, meaning enough sodium comes flooding into the cell to get me to negative 60 millivolts, then this first voltage gated sodium ion channel will open and then sodium will continue. Now the action potential starts. The sodiums will rush in saltatory conduction people, remember that for your lecture, flying in through the axon lemma at the nodes, creating this self-propagating, unstoppable wave of depolarization that runs down this axon. And when that wave hits the voltage-gated calcium ion channels, They will open as well, allowing calcium to flood into the cell, bind to the neurotransmitter, exocytosis. So we needed to get this action potential, this wave sweeping down the cell in this direction, if I can get a color that's going to show up, in this direction, nope so that we can get those voltage-gated calcium ion channels open and will happen. Now, that's a big mess of my picture, isn't it? As an AMP nerd, I just love it. Feel free to play this, rewind this as many times as you like. Thinking about the initiation of an action potential, which happens right here, sodium's coming in through the stimulus-gated sodium ion channels, bang, more sodium coming in through the voltage-gated sodium ion channels, till we get right up here. Right up here is where I would hear all the doors slam. This is all depolarization of my cell. Throwing out some lecture terms for you. That's all depolarization because the inside of the cell is getting more positive. Right up here, those voltage-gated doors would close, except for who? The slow and sluggish voltage-gated potassium channels. So now, potassium would be leaving my cell This is all called repolarization. The cell membrane started out polarized, thank you sodium potassium pump, then it depolarizes when the sodium rushes in and it repolarizes as the potassium slowly leaks out. In fact, Look at this little trough here. Think about it in your lecture. We let out a little too much potassium, don't we? But I'm getting a little far afield of the point. The point for us is for you to create a picture like this one, maybe many times over, to learn the parts and some of the functioning of this cell, which is a multipolar neuron. So. I hope you've enjoyed this. 
drawing of a neuron and talking about a little bit of the mechanics. If you draw a picture like this and it ends up looking like that, I literally love it. You should too. Draw a picture like this, draw your own, and then just make a mess out of the thing. Then draw it again and make a mess out of it again. This is a way to practice and to learn some of the functionality of this cell, a neuron. But for right now, I'll stop talking and see you find people in the next video.